Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you. So, hello, uh, I'm Andrew from uh, University of Leipzig, and uh, today I'm going to talk about frequent subgraph mining on Apache Flink, uh, which I just hide behind the title of uh, From Shopping Baskets to Structural Patterns, because it's kind of related to something uh, some of you might know from the term of uh, shopping basket ana analysis or association rules. So, uh, first of all, my question, uh, who of you regularly works with graphs? And with data mining? Oh, or with data mining? Yeah, and, and graphs and data mining? Only, all right, so there, so, all right, so I slow down a little bit, and yeah, I try to, to make the talk not too uh, s uh, much scientific, and rather give you a problem introduction and uh, challenges uh, in the implementation on Apache Flink or in distributed data flows in general. So uh, the contents are as follows. Uh, first, uh, I introduce the problem and uh, explain the details about the uh, current state of, this, uh, of these algorithms. Then I propose uh, a solution, uh, which we found uh, on top of Apache Flink in the context of the Gradoop framework. Uh, another question, who uh, was attending the talk before? So, all right, quite a lot. So, all right, so, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's in the context of an open source framework for distributed graph analytics called Gradoop. And uh, finally, I talk a little bit about, about some optimizations of our solution, if I find the time, and of course, conclude. So, part one is the problem. So, uh, the general uh, data mining, uh, class of data mining problems is called uh, frequent pattern mining. So, and we are talking about the transactional setting, which means we have uh, a collection of things, for example, shopping baskets, click streams, XML documents, chemical compounds, whatever. It just uh, depends on the data structure, but we have a collection of, let's say, data sets which might have different structures. And uh, in frequent pattern mining, we're interested in the patterns that, for example, occur in 80% of these things. And the frequent pattern mining can be ca categorized into the basic one is the frequent item set mining, for example, shopping baskets, where we're just interested in which things uh, frequently co-occur together. Uh, then we can, uh, if we add a constraint uh, that the, <coughs> seek, um, <coughs> the order of items matters, then we have frequent sequence mining, for example, a click stream. We're interested in which paths on a website go users uh, regularly or something like that. Then we can, again, extend it. If we also consider branching of paths, then we are uh, at frequent subtree mining, which is uh, a little bit more difficult than uh, sequence mining, but still um, uh, very <coughs> closely related to these things. And then at the end, if we are also interested in all the relationships, so trees might have, uh, uh, may have closing cycles and stuff like that, then uh, we have the problem of frequent subgraph mining. And an example are chemical compounds. So let's first go back to the simplest uh, variation of this problem. Uh, some of you might know association rules. That this is something like uh, people who brought, and, uh, brought <coughs> bread and butter often bought cheese and wine. So we can use this for recommendations. That's what uh, some web shops do, I, pro <coughs> I guess. For example, if you already added uh, two items to your shopping basket on Amazon, for example, then uh, one way to recommend you other things is using association rules which uh, are based on the results of um, uh, frequent pattern mining on uh, past data sets. In the frequent subgraph mining, we can uh, use it for similar things. For example, if we know that a substructure often occurs in illegal stimulants, and we have an unknown chemical uh, substance which contains a substructure, which is known to be often part of illegal stimulants, we can uh, have a look on this substance if it's maybe it's a candidate for a new illegal stimulant. I don't know if this example makes sense, but uh, I hope you got the idea. So um, the problem definition, just to conclude the <laughs> introduction, is uh, our input is a graph collection. So our collection of things, in this case, are graphs. And we have a min support threshold, which specifies the uh, minimum percentage of items or of um, search space things uh, which have to contain a pattern to be considered uh, to be frequent. And the output is uh, the complete set of frequent subgraph patterns, uh, which are supported above uh, the given threshold, so the min support. And to pre <coughs> wait, just give you a toy example. On the bottom, I hope it's visible for most of you guys. No. Oh. So on the bottom, <laughs> just then, just believe me, there, there are three graphs. 
This is uh, often called uh, a graph database. And yeah. Better? Better for you? I mean, it's smaller, but now more people uh, can enjoy the <laughs> fun on uh, seeing the graphs. So this is the input. It's a graph collection. So we see uh, they uh, first, uh, I need to tell you, in our problem scenario in the context of Groups, we are talking about directed multigraphs, which is a difference to uh, typical solutions. So which means our edges have a direction, like also in graph databases, like Neo4j. And our, we support multiple uh, edges between any pair of vertices, which, is, uh, which changed the problem a little bit from the algorithmic point of view. And uh, yeah, and then we have now we have three graphs, and we're interested in um, subgraphs, um, which we can describe by patterns. So a subgraph, just to um, not to confuse you, a subgraph is a part of a graph, and we're interested in such subgraphs which occur in at least 50%, so in two of three. And uh, typical algorithms use the abstraction of a frequent pattern lattice, so um, which contains different levels. In the first level, there are all uh, zero edge subgraphs, which means uh, just vertices. And we see we have a vertex A here, and A occurs in this graph, in this graph, and in that one. This is, we have a frequency of three. The same for B, frequency of three. We have C, frequency of one, because it only contains in this one. And thus, we can say, all right, it's not uh, above the threshold of 50%, which would be two. And thus, we can prune it. So now, we continue and grow children from that. Uh, we have, for example, AAB, uh, ABB, or this um, loop pattern, uh, and they have uh, they are children of the zero edge patterns, and we still see okay this one has a, a frequency of three, one and two, one is uh, below the threshold. That's why we can prune it. And finally, that's the largest frequent subgraph contained. Uh, we have this two edge subgraph, which is um, contained in two graphs. At K2, this is the actually this is the desired result, but it's not. An, we do not implement it as a data structure. It's just the uh, theoretical model behind uh, these algorithms. And from the data structure point of view, of course, we have graphs and we have patterns which we need to store somehow. But the most important thing are uh, embeddings. It's very similar to the previous talk uh, with the pattern matching. So we need embeddings uh, which map the patterns to. Um, <coughs> to actual subgraphs, and in this case, we can we see that uh, due to automorphism, so a graph might contain a pattern multiple times, which means this pattern is contained in this graph two times. So once is the green line, so this vertex is this vertex, and this vertex is this one, and because this uh, these vertices cannot be distinguished by their pattern, uh, we create a second embedding because of that. So this is everything. Uh, you need to know uh, before I start uh, explaining the algorithms. So we have graphs, which are the input elements. We have subgraphs, which are parts of the input elements. We have patterns, uh, which are nodes in our pattern lattice, uh, which are isomorphic to subgraphs. So isomorphic means there is a one-to-one -one mapping between vertices and edges. And uh, this is the tricky point of these algorithms, the same as pattern matching. And we have embeddings, which are mappings between patterns and subgraphs. And the challenges uh, in implementing such algorithms, especially in the context of shared nothing clusters, is that uh, we need to meet the data flow programming model, in this case of Apache Flink, but this also applies to Apache Spark or actually even MapReduce. And what we need to find is an efficient algorithm uh, which does not rely on shared memory. And uh, I hope uh, I don't want to <coughs> become too scientific now, so I just explain your algorithm efficiency. Uh, the problem of these algorithms is they contain the so-called uh, subgraph isomorphism problem, which is NP-complete. We need to uh, enumerate all uh, isomorphisms between graphs, actually, which is very expensive, and we cannot avoid this completely. If we want to have the complete set of frequent subgraphs, it's not possible to avoid this problem, but what efficient algorithms can do, they minimize the isomorphism testing effort. So uh, let me explain you, the, most of this work has been done in the uh, early 2000s, and, uh, but not in the context of um, uh, distributed data flow systems, but for single machines. So there were a priori approaches. These are based on a, a so-called breadth-first search in the lattice. 
uh, BFS, which means we process first uh, all frequent subgraphs of level one, then generate candidates, do pattern matching in the graph database, uh, find out frequent ones and join the frequent ones to, to uh, children. And then we again do the pattern matching and repeat this until there are no frequent subgraphs left. Uh, the good thing about this, these algorithms is that they only need one iteration per level and it uh, allows eff effective eff uh, frequency pruning. But the problems of these algorithms are they contain the subgraph isomorphism testing in the pattern matching. They contain additionally subgraph isomorphism testing in the candidate generation. So when you have two frequent patterns, you want to generate a child, you need to enumerate all uh, subgraphs of a certain level to generate children, which is also very expensive. You may generate candidates that don't even occur in a database because they're just candidates. There's no guarantee for them to, uh, to occur. And uh, the candidate generation itself is hard to parallelize without shared memory because you need, actually you need to uh, build the cross products of all uh, combinations. It's uh, yeah, just a lot of combinations. This is why uh, the more efficient uh, single machine approaches are based on a depth first search in a lattice. Uh, which means this is the BFS and this is the DFS. Uh, they need, uh, they go from, let's say, from this pattern, this is, let's say, the root pattern, to, to this pattern, then go to this, and the, uh, until no more frequent patterns are found. Then they jump back to a frequent uh, parent, and, and so on and so on. And the idea behind these algorithms is that we can skip some of the links in a lattice due to uh, uh, specific tricks, which I will not explain now because this uh, then really takes a lot of time. But it's possible with these algorithms to avoid uh, checking all the combinations. So, uh, and the idea is we have an edgewise extension of frequent patterns and uh, the growth rules uh, can reduce the search to a tree. Uh, for example, there's a G-span algorithm is a very popular example of, of this category. The problem is where the isomorphism still occurs is that sometimes we, we don't want uh, to visit, for example, this uh, edge in the or link in the lattice, but we uh, accidentally uh, visit it. This, this is why we need to, um, we need to check uh, the graph representation if it's really a valid, uh, if it's really on this tree that we wanted to find. So if we look at these algorithms, okay, it automatically finds canonical labels, which means uh, we do not, uh, we can compare the graph patterns by a simple string comparison. Uh, the isomorphism testing is reduced to a minimum. We just need to validate these labels, which is, um, the, and we only check patterns that actually exist. So we solved, uh, a lot of the problems um, of the a priori algorithms. But the problem is we need a large number of iterations for that and it can lead in a shared nothing cluster which with many, many, um, <coughs> many, many workers, it can lead to unbalanced uh, parallelization because uh, we can maybe parallelize uh, single paths but not uh, a whole level. The more idea of the new data flow systems is to bring the computation to the data which means processing all the, uh, for example, all the embeddings uh, of the same edge count at the same time. And this is not uh, easily possible with uh, this DFS approach. Come back to our um, toy example. We see um, this is why I use dotted lines for some of the links in the lattice. So the a priori approaches would go all the links or there are even some uh, optimizations which maybe skip some. But still, this is the, the basic difference. And in a pattern growth one, we can just leave out the dotted ones. OK, so now this is uh, everything you, you need to know about uh, frequent subgraph mining and the research in the past. And now we, we are facing these problems in the context of distributed data flow systems on shared nothing clusters. And uh, the, the solution to this problem is uh, something we call level-wise pattern growth which means we just do a parallel depth first search uh, in the lattice. Which means we process the lattice level wise, but, uh, but still skip the, the links we do not want to visit and still avoid um, the isomorphism problem due to gen candidate generation, for example. And this means we only need uh, K max iterations, which is the maximum edge count of the largest frequent pattern and can skip these links and we still minimize isomorphism testing. And this uh, uh, approach, fits the data flow programming model very well. I will show you the, uh, using some pseudocode how we can implement this on Apache Flink. So for uh, all who don't know Apache Flink, 
The basic extraction is you have data sets and then you have um, transformations on these data sets uh, which, uh, where uh, a high order function is a parameter uh, and uh, it's similar to lambda expressions but for data sets. And the idea is that the function is executed for each element of a data set or for a group of elements, for example. So, but there's no, uh, they, they completely run, concur <coughs> are executed concurrently and uh, all uh, things um, which uh, require global knowledge exchange, I need uh, to artificial, uh, <coughs> artificial, <coughs> I need to create uh, barriers in the data flow to uh, exchange global knowledge. So that's the, the problem in the shared nothing context. And uh, what you would do in a usual programming language, okay, you know these constraints, but the naive programming would be there would be a data set of graphs, there would be a data set of all frequent patterns, and there would be a data set of uh, k-edge frequent patterns. That's all, all the data sets we need. And then we have a loop, which uh, terminates until we do not find any k-edge frequent patterns anymore. And at the end, we are interested in all frequent patterns. That's what our algorithm should do. What can we do? For example, we uh, do uh, a pattern growth in the, in the beginning, which means, uh, and which we use something called broadcasting in Flink. It's like um, a very efficient cross product in a distributed data flow. We just um, send all uh, K uh, last iterations, frequent patterns to all machines, and then we can access them in the pattern growth step. And initially it's empty, so this is the dummy root in the lattice. Um, we apply the um, pattern growth using a map function, which means we update the graphs because we uh, not only the graph data set does not only contain graphs, it also contains a map in between patterns and embeddings. So which means uh, in the pattern growth step, we just check the map, uh, all the uh, keys which are also contained in the uh, frequent pattern set, we need to grow. And then in the next step, uh, we report the pattern. So after we group patterns, we report them using flat maps. Uh, flat map is, uh, is a, a like map function, but can be an arbitrary cardinality output. So it could output zero or many uh, patterns. Then we, uh, it, now it becomes a little relational. We group by patterns, so it's just a key, or it's very similar to the reduce function and map reduce. Uh, we just group by key, we sum the frequency, we filter out frequent ones, and we additionally need to filter valid ones because uh, sometimes there are some false positives. And we found out in our evaluations that it's far more efficient to group and uh, filter uh, invalid patterns instead of validating them in this step. Because in this step we have to validate uh, for each graph and each pattern, and here we only have to validate uh, for each um, pattern in the whole system. Which means, uh, imagine we have an input size of like 10 millions of graphs, uh, we do not repeat the same operations 10 million times, but do it here. And this is um, in comparison to the complexity of uh, counting a larger data set, it's, it's basically uh, free. Yeah, and finally, we uh, add the current uh, rounds frequent patterns to the all frequent patterns data set using a union operator. And that's, that's how naively everyone would program it. But the problem is that uh, Flink's bulk iteration, it's a data flow iteration, it's not like a typical while loop, it's uh, something uh, related to the um, batch API of Apache Flink. It uh, allows only exactly one data set uh, to be passed along iterations. And the uh, problem is here we have actually we have three data sets which, uh, where, which we manipulate during our iterations. So, in f But uh, there is a constraint that from iteration body we cannot access these data sets, so this doesn't work. So the first one, the FPK, there's a quite simple solution to that. We just uh, pull it out of the iteration and uh, repeat us a little bit uh, and just instantiate the set of uh, k-edge frequent patterns inside the loop so we, do not, we can avoid the external access. But this does not work for, the, uh, f for this union operation and our data set collecting all the frequent patterns of all iterations. This is where we use the very hacky approach we just, uh, at the beginning of the data flow, we added to the uh, graph data set uh, a new empty graph element, which is, um, which is actually, an, it's an empty graph with an empty map. And because it's an empty graph and we ensure that it's the only empty graph in the whole data set, we can identify it. 
And then we extend this map function, not only, we do not only apply pattern growth, but pattern growth or store. So we just check if the graph is empty. We can uh, use its pattern embeddings map to store frequent patterns. So um, because we can reuse, we don't need any additional data structure. We can just use the, the data structure we already have. And at the end, we filter out this single dummy graph, which was collecting all the frequent patterns and use a flat map, which uh, uh, creates a new uh, pattern element in the output data set, including its frequency. Um, frequency we uh, also can uh, encode in the mappings uh, and have the same result. So this really works. That was our, the solution to our problem. Okay, so this was the, the basic idea, how we uh, hope you understand the problem and how we implemented this on a distributed data flow system like Apache Flink. And now uh, we did some optimizations to this problem. So actually there are four of them and because two of them are uh, very difficult to explain uh, without becoming too scientific, we just skipped them. So one is uh, it's even more efficient to do the validation step in the combined function because it matters uh, to have uh, fewer tuples before your network traffic is caused. As for everyone's programming with um, uh, distributed data flow systems, it seems obvious. And we use a merge join instead of a cross to, uh, during the pattern growth process, but this needs a lot of explanation now. But what we also do, we do a pre-processing, where we use dictionary, enco dictionary encoding and label pruning to reduce the input size. And uh, the most efficient thing is uh, we do a pattern encoding and with a fast and effective compression technique. So the pre-processing's idea is basically we keep only vertices with frequent labels. Then if we, if we remove them, we also remove some edges. And then we consider only the remaining edges, which are not, which never occur uh, in <coughs> with frequent labels, uh, frequent vertices and uh, also count their frequencies. And we can also uh, drop all the edges with infrequent labels. And f based in, in these steps, uh, we have uh, the frequencies and all the labels, so we can just reduce them to create dictionaries between strings and integers. And because uh, the frequent subgraph mining contains a lot of comparison, equality, hash code building, whatever, uh, this is, it's, it's much more efficient to use integer labels instead of strings. And the workflow is then as follows, we first encode graphs, we process the actual mining, and we decode the patterns. Because in many scenarios, uh, we, we do not want patterns consisting of numbers, we just, we really want our uh, patterns, like RDF patterns, for example. So just to explain this approach, uh, we see here there's a vertex C, which contains, uh, is only contained in a single graph, and we see here is a edge labeled B, which if we only consider the edge label, it's, it's still frequent because it contains in here and here. But if we first remove this C guy, then this B1 uh, to uh, preserve um, <coughs> consistency would go to and B is not frequent anymore. And if we do this in a pre-processing, these patterns will never be discovered. And the second uh, optimization technique is um, the uh, pattern encoding and compression, so we do not store the graphs in a typical way as you natively would uh, um, program graphs using Java objects and so on because we found out that avoiding Java objects is uh, one of the most efficient tuning techniques you can do in Apache Flink. Uh, this is um, at least for this scenario. So we use multiplexed integer arrays to represent patterns and graphs and embeddings. We represent everything in multiplex integer arrays, uh, which require k times, so the edge count, uh, we need six uh, positions in the array for each edge. And we know that we only have positive values and we have very low upper bounds of the values. So the upper bound is uh, edge count or the size of the label dictionaries. And typically, we do not exceed uh, four to eight bits for this case. I say just typically, of course, you can create data sets uh, where it's different, but just say in the most use cases, um, that's enough. This is much less than 32 bits, which is usually required for a single integer, so we can use an integer compression, and we can roughly in our uh, data sets um, uh, encode uh, a complete edge from six to one integers in this case, which, uh, and we use simple 16 from this nice uh, open source package for this. And the effect of this is uh, we decrease network traffic because the patterns are shuffled over the network are smaller. We have a smaller grouping key in the group by operation, 
which means this is uh, notably faster. And also the map access, when we access the embeddings of our patterns, uh, they, we have much smaller map keys, so also this is more efficient. Then additionally, we uh, experimented with graph and embedding compression, to mainly to decrease memory usage and uh, to allow faster serialization between transformations. And this is also something we have learned this really matters in a patch of link. Uh, and the decompression we execute only on demand. For example, embeddings of um, uh, infrequent uh, patterns will never be decompressed and so on. So there are a lot of detailed optimizations. Yeah, then we did uh, some uh, evaluations. So we used, I do not uh, talk about uh, absolute runtimes now because it doesn't make sense if you do not have any background knowledge about the data sets and what does it mean. But what we did here in these experiments, we have two data sets. One is synthetic, to, uh, we have one million graphs, 90% support, but it gives already a lot of patterns, this data set, and contains directed multigraphs. And uh, the classical scenario, which is used by all other work in uh, the field of frequent subgraph mining is a molecular data set with undirected simple graphs with 1 million graphs and 10% support. So there's a quite low support and it's, at, it's 1 million molecules. It's, uh, I mean, with other types of data, you can have big data problems with uh, uh, much larger input sizes, but here the problem is the, are the intermediate results and uh, uh, computing complexity. So we see we uh, used this data set and scaled up from 6 to 96 uh, threads, which is uh, roughly the same as uh, 1 to 16 nodes in a cluster, machines. And we see that, uh, especially on this uh, synthetic data set, for which we, uh, we optimized our algorithm for directed multigraphs, uh, it uh, shows a quite good scale up. And for the, even for the molecular database, it's, it's uh, not bad, it's not linear, and it's, uh, but it's still quite good. And then we also evaluated the impact of our um, uh, optimizations. So depending on the data set, uh, in this data set again, we created many, many infrequent labels that this technique is very efficient, to, uh, of course, but there may be, there are real world data sets such like RDF, for example, which have these characteristics, uh, which we considered at the design of this synthetic data set. So we see that uh, overall uh, scalabilities, uh, all parallelism levels, so from 6 to 96 parallel slots, we see that the dictionary encoding in this case can slow down the, the total runtime uh, by up to 400%. Then we just avoided pattern compression, so we only used the integer representation, which is already uh, like uh, ten, 10 times faster than using strings. Uh, this goes, uh, brings, is a notable um, effect, especially on the molecular database. Uh, the embedding compression still has uh, a notable impact, uh, probably due to the serialization time. Uh, but graph compression, it's, it's a little uh, uh, tuning effect, but there, it's not too much. All right. So conclusion, uh, what we did is the first uh, approach to graph collection, frequent subgraph mining using an in-memory data flow system. There are MapReduce approaches, but in this kind of system, by best of our knowledge, we're the first. And uh, we support directed multigraphs from arbitrary string-labeled input. So you can just enter a string-labeled input file and you get string-labeled uh, patterns. We do not need to do any external preprocessing. Uh, it works, uh, but using Flink requires some workarounds as, I, as you have seen, and we think it's a much better choice than MapReduce because in each iteration you have to update three data sets. And this is, some, this is also, for MapReduce you also need workarounds to solve these problems, <coughs> but these MapReduce workarounds are by far more expensive than the workarounds you need for the Apache Flink based approach. And uh, the availability of the, it's part of the Gradoop framework, this distributed uh, framework for uh, graph processing. It's, uh, it fits its algorithm API. The current version uh, you will find in the master branch is not optimized. It's still using Java objects and strings and stuff like that. So it's not very uh, efficient. And the optimized version is still a messy research prototype, but will be merged to the master soon. So thank you. If you have any questions. Did you manage to try this on real world uh, data set? Uh, so evaluate this uh, project on with a business partner. I mean, on real purchases and data. And no, 
uh, we have the problem is the availability of such data sets. So we have a data generator which creates this type of data, uh, but um, this, this is why we use the synthetic data set which contains loops, uh, parallel edges, uh, some, some um, many automorphisms. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. I happen to know that MSD in Prague has a data set like that. Excuse me? I happen to know that MSD in Prague has a data set like that. Yeah? Yeah, that's what they're working on. Well, what is in there? Uh, molecular data. Yeah, but yeah, molecular data, of course. I have there are tons of molecular data sets. But uh, the, the thing is that they do not, uh, uh, in molecule data sets, you have only two types of edges. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a, single, a single bound and, and uh, double bound. You have a very limited set of vertex labels and uh, very, uh, there are very um, low number of specific patterns that occur. Like you have uh, some cycles. So molecule, of course, you can tune the algorithm to molecule databases. But it's uh, we wanted to make a general approach, fitting all the uh, the data sets, and because we have no data set.